find adventure at the click of a button, or from the turn of a page, or the casting of a die. Join your hosts, Conniff and Shiloh, on an unforgettable journey. Questing the Multiverse. Welcome, listener, to episode 26 of Questing the Multiverse. We are so excited to have you here. We've got some fun things to talk about this episode, uh, one of which is the beginning of our... I was going to call it like a Lord of the Rings deep dive, but I more just like a... Let's start treading in the water and see what we can find, because we're not going to get super deep. I don't think either of us are lore hounds like our friend Ardeth, but... Um, we're going to take a look at that. We got some news. We mm -hmm. got some uh, other fun things. But I did want to say, if this is your first episode, or maybe it's your second episode, and if it is your second episode, uh, the previous episode you listened to was a special board game episode that we're going to be doing once a month with our friend Jordan. So welcome back, all of you video game people, to our regularly regularly scheduled wag wag <laughs> episodes <clears throat> shiloh elmer, F elmer fudd all this how have you been this past week i've been good uh it's good yeah i woke up in kind of a funk today but uh took a little late morning power nap and uh been pretty good ever since so is it that you know, 70 degree weather the midwest is having that's throwing off your internal barometer maybe <laughs> maybe maybe i just took a minute to kind of reset the button and uh maybe yes. i did it prematurely since i think next week is what the end of daylight yes savings time i guess it's the no. beginning of yes I don't know. what whatever um, the beginning yeah. of daylight savings. The beginning which, and the beginning of the end. There we go. <laughs> That's also maybe true. Uh, I know that at one point there was this rumor or this idea that the U.S. government was going to make daylight savings time permanent. So uh, it's it's really confusing. But like, what is about to happen? If you're listening to this episode on release day, which would be March fourth, I think. Um. Daylight savings time is about to become activated, and that is the version of it that I think is the best. It's when we fall back in the fall that is terrible because then it gets dark by you know four thirty five p.m. You know, just depressing. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, it could be that. Might not be. Uh, I oh. did want to say Shiloh. Mm -hmm. Uh, do you wake up with like an actual alarm clock or do you use your phone as an alarm clock? My phone. Okay. So I recently switched because I like probably almost all Americans waste way too much time on my phone at nighttime. <laughs> you know, just here's another dumb video. Here's another dumb video. Uh, just or reading articles or what have you, you know, what have you. And so I was like, I want to try sleep you know using my phone less and mm. uh part of that is you know the first thing i would do when i'd wake up in the morning you know for, first thing i last thing i do before going to bed look at my phone first thing i do in the morning look at my phone and so i was like what if i got like an actual alarm clock and um so i did and then every night that i have tried using it I have woken up before the alarm goes off anyway. So <laughs> I don't know what that says, but it's just yeah. been mega annoying because I can't actually tell if like it's going to work right. You know, it's going to help me yeah. in the long run or if I'm if yeah. it's even going to get loud enough or whatever. But so yeah, that's kind of my new I'd, thing. That it's half and half with me. I will wake up half the time before half the time right on. So gotcha. But yeah, I bought a new wireless phone charger thing. It's basically oh, just yeah. sits on my little nightstand. It's been a it's been a game changer because my I don't know what it is about phone company. This is another shot of the But wire so the wire chargers on phones just always break for me. Um mm. 
I don't know if it's a particular phone brand that I use or if it's just because I work in the restaurant industry and and I <laughs> and I cut wood. Um, so inherently there's <laughs> wood particles and grease and f food stuff. I mean, I keep my phone in my back pocket, but you know, it's like, it, it just happens, you know, yeah. just, so I don't know. I don't know if I just get gunk up in the, uh, area where you got to stick the charger in, but <laughs> I don't know, but nonetheless, it's been a game changer for me because I can just throw it on there and it's a wireless charger and it's only adaptive charging but it you know it's at night i don't i don't use my phone at night so oh well, i'm sleeping so can't <laughs> i would sleeping. hope not right <laughs> yeah making weird amazon be, purchases at yeah, 4 a.m creepy well other yeah. than phone chargers and alarm clocks what have you been up to this week because i know that i was in, you mentioned you were in a funk today i mm. was in a funk this week and i was like i don't I just don't feel like socializing a lot. Um, and part of that is like, you know, if I have a lot of meetings at work and I spend all my work day socializing and talking and interacting with humans, by the time the evening rolls around, I just want to be like literally rest my voice and do nothing. So yeah. I haven't yeah, seen you no, all I, week, really. That's yeah. I mean, I I suppose I've been in a game funk. I think probably maybe a lot of us are. Yeah, uh, gamers in general. Maybe just you and I, or I'm not. No, I won't speak for you, but me in particular. Yeah, I I don't really have an MMO that I've been really playing a whole lot, and there's just nothing really reaches out and like play me because it. It's all old stuff. I've already done pretty yeah. much everything. So, um, yeah, so I've just been playing Nightingale and mm. enjoying my time in that. But it's one of those games I play for maybe an hour, hour and a half at a time, and then I'm done for the night. You know, I that's generally about the amount of time after work that I have before I go to bed anyway. But even if I don't play for that full hour and a half, I will, I've been watching shows or reading or you know just listening to music like i listen to music for the better part of the morning um today gotcha. and while you're doing house chores and whatever else. yeah just cooking and house chores and cleaning and stuff just you know what's interesting is you mentioned tv shows and in two episodes ago three episodes you mentioned true detective with jody foster mm -hmm. and <clears throat> of course that whole conversation we had on air and everything and then, like, three days after that, while I was at work, one of my coworkers was brought up True Detective, um, you know, and it was pertinent to whatever conversation we're having. I was like, I actually know what you're talking about now. <laughs> <laughs> but she was saying that it, this season is pretty creepy, which is kind of what you were saying with the old, mm -hmm. like, the... What type of folklore is that? So, you know, think of, like... Like, do you know what a lesion is from The Witcher? Like those forest spirits yeah. that have like yeah. the deer skulls and you know, you know that type of thing. Like, mm -hmm. what, what type of folklore would you call that? Like in my mind, I'm thinking like well, maybe that's like Appalachian folklore because that's kind of the vibe it gives off. Like the like American druid, druid maybe. I don't, I don't know. Yeah. I would think that that lesson would probably be right. Like some sort of Polish or Finnish or, I mean, sure. considering he's Polish. Um, but like the American of, equivalent of that, like, yeah. What is that? Um, well, you, you're talking about the night country in particular. Yeah. But like, you also think like, like you get into stuff with like Mothman and like, like the skinwalkers, oh, yeah. which skinwalkers, that's kind of like old Indian folklore and stuff. Like maybe Native American, you could probably put this, but like mm -hmm. this like old sort of older like urban fo urban folklore. Wicker, type of thing. yeah, that type of yeah. stuff. It's interesting. Yeah. I think it would just be urban folklore. Yeah. It's so modern that, it, you know, yeah. compared to <laughs> Germanic and Polish and Finnish and that sort of folklore. 
fairly new. That's fair. So yeah. and, and pretty pretty uh propagandized, I suppose you could say, with newspapers and things that you know Supporter, probably spread yeah. spread that sort of uh gossip around so that's probably why it's called urban folklore i don't know i don't have a degree in <laughs> urban folklore you or just, whatever. And you're not a expert on the area at all <laughs> no no <clears throat> find it fascinating though yeah it makes me um i don't know that, that, i guess that's why i kind of always have a weak spot for fallout 76 is because yes. it does have a, a lot of that in invested in it it makes it kind of fascinating to me yeah well and um, you were mentioning yeah. nightingale and mm -hmm. uh, you know to get into more of that a bit nightingale we talked about this when we first kind of brought it up on the show but it's that dark fey style fantasy yeah um reminiscent graphically and thematically i guess you could call it bioware-esque or mm. you know okay. bioware bioshock you mean i'm sorry bioshock <laughs> yeah i was like okay. not bioware uh bioshock parallel or bioshock-esque um but it's it's nothing like it doesn't play anything like bioshock it's not a first person uh rpg with some scare tactics kind of jump scare stuff yeah. that kind of they throw at you with with things but uh it's a it's a survival um multiplayer at least you can play multiplayer um they were going to offer an offline version of the game okay which i know a lot of people were pretty excited about yeah uh, because it, you know you don't have to play online but they've x that for mm. for right now i'm sure it'll come back um during for a full release so the game is in early access it's about 30 dollars on steam i think right now yep. and uh i've been enjoying it a lot it's gotten some mixed reviews on steam um lots of people are kind of down on it i i think even people that were really hopeful about it are like yeah uh, Nightingale could have been the greatest thing since sliced bread, but you know, I'm like, oh, okay, here we go. If you had uh, a dollar for every video people, video game people said that about, you would not be. You wouldn't um, be playing video games, I guess. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, so there's that, and if you don't have to listen to what I say about it, because I did buy it. I'm, in, but I'm also the type of person I could buy it and be like, yeah, it's not for me, but. It is for me, I think. It mm. kind of scratches that itch of of having something, number one, fun to play that's uh, engaging. Um, I like the gameplay loop of, of the survival stuff. It makes sense. Um, it is a little janky, but the combat is still pretty good, especially for a survival type of game. Uh, I made the comment earlier with you and Tempest that, uh, other than Tempest mentioned Pal World and... Um, Yes. And uh, what's the other one? Uh, Enshrouded. Enshrouded. Yeah. That just recently came out. So you've got two fairly big survival games that are pretty well received that aren't necessarily janky. Um, and this one is. Uh, but compared to older survival games that I've played, um, you know, <laughs> early in Fallout 76 career. Oof. Yes. Um, Ark is in my opinion, pretty, pretty dang janky. Um, Conan Exiles I played <laughs> pretty janky. So I, I would expect nothing yeah. less. Um, so I'm kind of, I'm, I'm okay with that. Um, and I know it'll eventually get better. Will it get better by the time I'm done playing the game? I probably not. You know, I don't know. <laughs> um, but that's you know that's the price that's what we said me. about fallout 76 so and we did come back that's to true it but we yeah we played that forever times. um i just don't see myself playing this forever like i yeah. uh, will get to an end game and um maybe i'll just stop at an end game and since i already own the game 
if anyone else picks it up and they get all the way through the end game, but they're wanting to do dungeons because that's technically the end of the ladder, um, the end of mm. the uh, the end game for the game is you get to the city of Nightingale, and you, it's basically this portal system with these cards that you get out in the world through quest and ex- exploration mm. um and then you can also you need to craft these cards too so you kind of you need you have to craft everything it's you know it's a survival game yeah. so there's a huge element of crafting uh and the crafting in the game is very very well done i will say that the the housing it, it's all i'm still f- kind of early in the mid range of the game so i i think i just unlocked the desert plans to build like uh like uh you know sultan looking yeah. temples and things like that if i wanted to so but i just did that today so um but, and i haven't unlocked the tutor style and i haven't unlocked um there's another one that's a little bit more uh, oriental themed oriental in yeah, theme so there's that um but it's uh it's very well done and I, I, i'm i'm enjoying it i played a little bit with tempest um so there's it's fairly easy i guess to we were having troubles with mayan like him being able to accept an invite but i was mm-hmm. able to accept his invite for some reason i don't know that could be lots of different things considering he's in new zealand and i'm in <laughs> tennessee so but all that aside, I I'm enjoying the game quite a bit, and it's it's fun, it's unique, it's different, it's a uh, it's a survival crafting game um, where you build a base and um, you have a little follower. I, reportedly, the follower there, there's a big bug where the follower, if she collects or he or she collects wood. They will automatically if they go by a campfire because you have to fuel, you know these yeah. these you know your your smithing area and your campfire and there are campfires out in the world that you'll find just kind of in in little points of interest and stuff and she'll just well mine mine's name is adeline which i think is kind of cute but and she'll just dump firewood in the campfire like all the wood that she might have <laughs> collected the, yeah. or that you've dumped off on her she'll just like oh look this campfire is empty and just blah <laughs> just throw throw up fire. all of her wood on the campfire and you have no idea so you're wandering around and you get back home to your base like, and you i click should on, have like 500 wood yeah where would all my wood go adeline <laughs> but that's funny. Anyway, but uh, you know these types of little things aside, and that's why this is in early access. You know, people oh, yeah. to try this out, them them to figure it all out, and eventually come out with a full release. So, but I I honestly can say if you are looking for something in this nature and something to kind of scratch that itch, and then, and you're not a fan of Enshrouded, and you don't like po- Pokemon Pal World stuff, <laughs> then maybe give Nightingale a shot. Yeah. That's I guess that's my self pitch. I don't know, um, and I, I those all kind of fit my bill. And I know that in Shrouded is it, it. I guess it's technically sound and it's uh, not very janky at all. But yeah. I know Tempest was saying it just just kind of falls a little flat for him yeah. story wise, or you know, he said it was too easy and, to like. Oh uh, yeah, but he had been playing Elden Ring and. Uh, oh. V Rising can be pretty challenging. Yeah, too. it can be challenging. So, yeah, I get I get what he's saying. Yeah. Well, it's on my list to get and play at some point. Mm-hmm. I just have all this other stuff that keeps coming around or whatever. First, one of yeah. those is Hell Divers, and and I think it's mm-hmm. important to note that like of the two of us, I am the one that prefers first person shoot no, not not prefers i am the one that is more open to like first person shooters third person shooter whether it's pvp or pve uh that you know type of gameplay is my jam whereas mm-hmm. it's not so much yours and uh, yeah. th- we've been playing and by we i mean those of us in loreforged who've been around for a while so loreforged quick plug is uh, our friends Cash Jibs and Sunny, their podcasting community for Ashes of Creation. Um, and while Ashes of Creation is kind of their focus, I know 
as I am one of their officers, that Loreforge specifically is more of their podcasting community driven venture that could potentially be across all sorts of games right in the future mm -hmm. but right now ashes of creation uh, but several of us have been playing hell let loose off and on for the better course of a year and a half now and that's a game that you've never once played and you have no interest in it and so hell divers mm -hmm. is much the same thing in uh, as far as like you not really you, you know, like you know what it is you've seen people play it, you've seen videos it's just not your cup of tea uh, those of you listening that no doubt you've probably heard of hell divers too and kind of the the big explosion in popularity it's had over the course of the past few weeks since it's been out and um i am no i guess stranger to <laughs> what that's all about and so first things first shiloh the reason this game i think has kind of blown up the way it has been is because mm -hmm. they took an approach you know too many shooters are all seriousness or all yeah. comedy and the all serious ones like hell let loose you know it makes sense right it's it's emulating world war ii a very serious time in history mm -hmm. uh, obviously a very you know polarizing topic depending on where you're at in the world um although i mean i guess ultimately there's aspects of it that shouldn't be polarizing at all and yet here we are <laughs> but um hell divers 2 sort of flips the script in that it is a very intense and serious you know fight uh gun play game you know it's third person you drop in these drop pods and you are there to do a mission and liberate the planet or wherever from either the bugs or the terminids or the automatons or automatons however it's pronounced uh, which is like this alien think like almost terminator looking race um mm -hmm. alien robot looking race you know of just all these robots and there's, uh, but the way the game is being ran is everybody in the world that's playing this game. Uh, and if you are playing, you know that for like the first week and a half, the servers legitimately could not handle the popularity of the game. And the developers, you know, I think they said that the peak player count for their previous title, Helldivers 1, was like 10,000 concurrent players on Steam or something. Uh, this one was at like 40, 400,000 pretty quick. <laughs> and so they planned for like 50,000 to 100,000 for server and it just, just straight up could not take the amount of people that were excited to play this game. But the game is played basically all live, right? So like the state of the planets, the galactic war that's happening in this game is all live. So, like, you and your buddies can get on and go help liberate a planet. Uh, and you can see when you're at the map screen how many players are fighting, like, in this front. And how many players are fighting in this front. How many players are fighting on this planet versus this planet. So on and so forth. And so it's apparently, you know, real active data that is helping bring this war about. And, you know, and... Uh, all this stuff and the the developers just recently re released the information that there is someone at their company who is designated as the game master who is in control of like some of the events that happen when certain things happen on you know certain planets as far as like the whole galactic conquest thing goes so it's this really neat combination of like actual live game um and then just this, you know, third person shoot 'em up, you know, liberating game. The whole joke is, you know, you're going, uh, you're 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 being sent from Super Earth to deliver managed democracy. And uh, the very first time you launch the game, there's a very entertaining propaganda video about like becoming a hell diver. And then you go the first time you play, you go through the basic training 
which brings about, you know, a whole lot of like slapstick, you know, old, almost like 50s, 60s uh, military humor. And so the mm. humor is is at the just the perfect level that it, it doesn't feel cheesy at all. It feels extremely like appropriate for the just the theater of war that you are taking part in. And it's it's fantastic. So um, I've been playing other things, too. But, you know, like if we were to pick two games, I think the two of us are kind of actually looking at it's you with Nightingale and me with Helldivers, too. So it's been fun. It's been a blast. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it sounds like a lot of fun. I, yeah. like you said, it's just not necessarily my cup of tea. I've yeah. thought about picking it up, but you would yeah. like it. Only, I mean, there is no PVP, right? It's only PVE. Yeah. Um, it's almost like if Destiny Two dropped you in like a map, but it was like a map. Like for instance. Um, I'm trying to, I, I was going to pick a planet and I was like, I don't even think that planet's in the game anymore. <laughs> um, so we will pick one that's not in the game that I know you and I did stuff on. Well, you know, Titan. Um, and maybe they brought Titan back. I don't even know. But the old Titan, like let's say you get dropped on Titan with you and three other buddies and you're just trying to uh, complete this objective across the entire map. Like that's kind of what it is, except it's third person um, mm. and it's way more difficult like truthfully um yeah. and crazy and it, there's uh team killing no well that's on but uh what is that called? friendly fire. friendly fires on like yeah. just today you know cash and myself and tempest were in a squad and we're playing and cash had this little drone called a you know drone dog or something i don't remember the <laughs> exact name but it shoots a laser out at the enemies well, if you stand in the way of his drone and the enemy, the laser's going right at you. And it killed, he killed himself with his own drone dog like four times in this match. Oh, and then at man. the very end, when we called the drop ship to evacuate, because we were getting extremely overrun by these bugs, when the drop ship comes down, if you are standing underneath the engine, like the thrusters, you literally get burned to a crisp and die. <laughs> so it's it's just that type of stuff makes it hilarious people often get killed by friendly um stratagems which you know like you can call down an orbital strikes and um napalm strikes and cluster bombs all sorts of things yeah if, if your guy whiffs at throwing that stratagem or it hits something and bounces back at you you're toast so wow it's just very entertaining in that capacity yeah the only I got a funny story about Nightingale. There's okay. a little bit of that in Nightingale, but uh with friendly fire and stuff. Well, yeah, Adeline, my my companion, my little hench lady. Uh <laughs> you, you can give him your you, wood whatever, burning <laughs> pyromaniac. <laughs> yeah, whatever uh tool you give them is what they'll go out and use. So okay. I I'd given her an axe because I was trying to build my house and so she's over there just chopping down trees and she'll gather up the stuff they're actually it's pretty decent ai yeah however <laughs> i'm over doing something else and i can't remember exactly like probably just picking up plants for plant fiber and stuff <laughs> yeah. and all of a sudden there's you know it's a boom and i'm just dead and I look around and she's just standing in the background like with her axe <laughs> and there's a tree on top of me. So she had chopped down a tree <laughs> and had fallen on top of me and killed me. And then she wouldn't revive me. So <laughs> this was so I her villain had era. to respawn, get my stuff, and then I quickly took away her axe and I gave her a sickle. <laughs> oh, you better watch out if you ever go to the fields, <laughs> you know. Well, she can't hit she can't hurt me with falling weeds, so she can with the uh, falling trees though. That's hilarious though. Funny. Yeah, and you can do that to yourself. Like you can if you stand underneath a tree while it's falling, you'll you'll get injured. I kind of wish die. more games did that. Like uh New World, when you go to chop a big tree and it just Yeah, that'd be kind of interesting. Oh, especially boom. in a PV if you're flagged for PVP, which you know, a lot of people in New World do that because yeah. you get more resources and and better chance for rares and stuff from from crafting drops from from trees and things like that so it'd be kind of amusing to just run around 
<laughs> try to dodge trees while trying to kill somebody would be kind of funny. Yeah. But uh, yeah, it would be interesting. Well, speaking of Destiny 2, ah, uh, yes. should we get into the news here? Yes, I did want to mention um, one last thing. Oh, sure, sure. And that's I saw Dune Part 2. Oh, yes. You need to go see it. Have you, you have you read the book? First question. I have. It was a okay. long time ago. I will be reading um, the book this year. You've seen the first movie, though, with Timothy Chalamet yes. and, yeah. and company. Okay. And, yeah. You should go, if you get a chance, go see the second movie, and then we will do an episode. Because okay. I have a, I have a, I have a mindset, not a mindset, I have like a concept, or I guess a hot take is probably more what it would be about the those two movies specifically. Those two movies, but, okay. So I did yeah, want to get that I in. own the first one, so I'll have to rewatch that. Yeah. It's in Dude. theaters right now. Uh, it is like two hours and 50 minutes, as you'd Oof. expect. Um, but it was. Is there an intermission? No. Do they do that uh, in re- in real life out, outside of I've, the theater? I've seen a movie that actually had an intermission before. This was a long time ago. So I hmm. think when I was with my parents, I was a kid or early tween or whatever, you know, like a yeah. 13, 14 year old or something when um, the movie, I don't remember the name of it, the space movie, it's really long. Uh, 2001 Space Odyssey. I don't know. No. Is that long? I don't. I've never uh, seen it. So. It's it, that's long, but not as long as this. It it starts out with Chuck Chuck Yeager and oh crap. I'll have to, I'll I'll look it up later. But anyway, it's this long movie, and I I just remember like it's like intermission, <laughs> and then the screen went white, and you could like get up and go to the bathroom. And but I've seen movies that have been just longer than this one, um, and. Yeah, no intermission. I think what maybe the first Lord of the Rings or one of those is really, really, really long. But well, when they first did the extended editions, Blu-ray didn't exist yet, and so it, they're on two different discs, you know, DVDs, and so you have to pop out one to put in the next one, so that type of thing. But data is getting so compact now that I don't think you're going to see that. Because I think what back in the day it was so they could change the reel out right on the films, mm-hmm. and now you know they don't need to do that. Oh, the movie was the right stuff. Oh, never heard of it. Yeah, um, but it has an intermission. From what I remember, it was in 1983. Okay, IMDb, the right stuff. Uh, yeah. Uh, da da fascinating but yeah it starts it's basically just this chronology of aerial space stuff that because it starts out with chuck yeager breaking the sound barrier and then it gets into neil armstrong and um okay and and that stuff it's got ed harris sam shepherd scott glenn it's 7.8 out of 10 on imdb so it was a good movie nice back in the day but uh, add it to my watch someday list yeah but, but you're anyway. saying speaking of destiny 2 yeah we were. oh good good old destiny 2 news because <laughs> this is not gonna end well is it um <laughs> and it's not so the reportedly this is uh, this is on a report i don't know how accurate these numbers are but uh, according <laughs> to a source so uh the let's see i'm pulling up uh, it's an x tweet or x what do you even <laughs> call that now tweet. i An call x. it twitter because just yeah, I habit just it twitter but i think the more social media conscious people are trying to use x to be more trendy or um yeah but keep what do you call times. like uh, uh, yeah, on it, twitter it, this, it was a tweet this what is do you the call problem it x? yes yeah. that is the, exactly the problem <laughs> all right well someone xed all over the place <laughs> We'll just say, <laughs> just sounds like I'm just trying to censor myself from saying something. Um, uh, so, according to this, the final shape, which is the last uh, bit, so we had was it Beyond Light, Lightfall, and then the final shape. This was Witch their, Queen's in there. Oh, yeah, that's right. Maybe Beyond Light wasn't okay. Beyond Light was different. That was a kind of a precursor. So it's Witch Queen. Uh, yeah, Lightfall. but that was part of it, right? Because of the darkness. Kind so of the, 
Yeah, it was the pre prelude, I guess. Yeah. And it was, and it was short, so good. prelude fits. Yeah. Um, but it was, uh, so the final shape pre-order seemed to be about 25% of Lightfall's total figures, which Lightfall, for what it was, it, it had a lot of good numbers out of the gate, probably because it was coming off the tail end of the Witch Queen, which was pretty was touted good, as being a really, really good yeah, uh, expansion. expansion for the game. Lightfall was not. Uh, that's pretty much my consensus and most of the Destiny community sent consensus. So, yeah. uh, so their final shapes uh, pre-ordered numbers are twenty five percent of what Lightfall's total figures were, which is not a good uh, sign for the game. And no. they've postponed. <laughs> it was supposed to come out because they generally come out in late February. And they've postponed it to June. And so they have one of those long seasons like they did with the season of the wish. I think it was, it was right before lightfall. I can't remember. Oh yeah. Um, or one of those, uh, just one of those really just grueling long seasons. that just never seems to end. So they're having that now until the release of, uh, the final shape. And uh, <sighs> I guess destiny players are just like, well, what do we do? So yeah, probably play other games is my uh, my tip. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, Which that's is sad. Uh, that's but <sighs> yep. So that will end the uh, Destiny Two discussion. Yeah. Next little bit of news we got. Uh, this I thought was pretty interesting. Um, first, because Rings of Power for season two is uh, got a release date, and yeah. that release date will be later this year so thinking late fall i think is when the first season came out probably like i think it was in november early november maybe late october is that 2022 um, when it came out it's been like a few yeah. years hasn't it yeah i think it was 2022 um hmm. yeah i believe so and uh so it looks interesting and reportedly and again, this is just a, a story that Tom Bombadil might dance his way into the second eight story. So we're going to cover, at least I'm going to cover a little bit of Tom Bombadil and we'll yes. talk about Tom. Good old Tom. Tom, Tom. Tom, um, Bombadil, Tom And Bombadil. I'm sure a lot of people are like, well, that doesn't make any sense. Like, he, mm. But he's an ageless character and he would have been around... Well, basically, since if you read the books, he's been around. Mm -hmm. He remembers when the first acorn fell in the old forest. So he's been around basically since the beginning of time. Uh, he, he's not really, no one really knows exactly what exactly he is. There's like a not, lot of fun theories about that character yeah, specifically. There, there's a lot of fan theories and, and speculation, but Tolkien particularly left that one, that mystery left unsolved. Like he didn't explain it. Um, he just said there's a strange guy with a bright blue coat and yellow boots and <laughs> has a beard, Big brown hat, funny hat yeah. yeah, and a beard. And he likes to sing and tells riddles and dance. And he lives in the old forest with his wife, uh, Goldberry. So, yeah, yeah, that's pretty much what we know. So it'll be interesting to see. I'm sure that they'll probably have Gandalf or what a spoiler alert. Um, <laughs> Sorry. That one character that we aren't supposed to know who it is till yeah, the finale that guy. or something. Yeah. yeah, the the old crazy person that might 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 be Gandalf. <laughs> He's Gandalf, but uh, her, him, and uh, is it Mori? Oh, it's been so long. I think so. I think so. I something think like right. that. Yeah, um, might not be quite it. But. Yeah, the. Um, but they're not river hobbits, right? They're uh, or are they river hobbits technically? Well, they're Harfoots, so yes. yeah. Um, but I'm sure that her and, and this strange man, the stranger is what I think he's called for the longest time, um, will probably stumble upon him on their journey. So yeah, but yeah, that that could be interesting and, and fun. Um, you know, the show gets some flack. I know Ardeth isn't necessarily a huge fan of the show, but I thoroughly enjoyed it, probably just because it's more Tolkien that I get to kind of watch. And yeah. it's, 
it's pretty it it it's done well there's some character things like halbrand like you know who the who the hell is a halbrand like a, you know that, that that whole thing but yeah maybe he'll just disappear and turn into a spoiler again uh, somebody else but anyway um <laughs> but yeah that'll be interesting and, and i'm glad it it's coming. Plus, I I like the actri- actress that plays Gladriel. I think she does a yeah, pretty good job. Yeah, she does job. do a great job. Um, she's no uh, uh, Kate Blanchett. I almost said Kate, Kate right? Blanchett. Yeah, yeah, I almost said Kate, Kate Winslet because I had watched the <laughs> Mayor of East Town. So I'm like Kate Winslet. No, that's not right. <laughs> <laughs> she never. She I never, never was on the Titanic. F- I never finished Rings of Power. I think I've got like two episodes, one episode left. And my prevailing thought towards Rings of Power is simply that after the first episode or two, I felt like they were afraid of scale uh, or that, you know, the budget didn't allow for scale and times have changed or whatever. And what I mean by that is like if you go and watch helm's deep scene or you go and watch return of the king yeah the size of the battles right and yes i know that like maybe just what's happening is not quite at that scale and so that's part of it but like but it's the way it's shot too because the star wars prequels did this where there's a lot of wide grandiose shots in these movies um, and then obviously Disney came and took over and, and if you watch Andor or which Andor is a, a spy thriller style movie, so I get it, but like Mando mm. or their trilogy that they put out, there's mm. not a lot of these like grand big scale fights or whatever, where you see the impact of what this is doing to the surrounding area. And of course Peter Jackson's trilogy had a lot of that, you know, a lot of this grand, yeah. huge scale shots, these wide, lengthy shots where the camera doesn't do much other than just pan for 10 seconds or more. Um, there's a lot quicker, you know, cinematography. And and maybe that's just the way it's evolved because of our attention spans, but... Um, I thought they did great with that in the first episode or two of Rings of Power, but then everything in Rings of Power then became so like small scale that it felt a little jarring, Mm -hmm. but I enjoyed it. I didn't have like the reservations that those really in deep Tolkien fans and well-studied Silmarillion scholars have, but Mm -hmm. yeah, I don't know. We'll see. I I think it'll be interesting to see Tom Bombadil in in uh, Rings of Power, especially since it wasn't in Peter Jackson's trilogy, wasn't in the original animated movie. So no, yeah, it'll be it'll be interesting. Um, I don't know if I want to cover it now, or I guess I could I'll just go ahead and mention it now. But there's there's interesting that you know they I think he particularly just couldn't figure out a way to accurately put the him and the old forest and um the barrow down incidents before they get to Bree, the hobbits that is yes. Frodo and Mary and Pippin and uh, Sam and he chose not to do that probably because he just he just didn't know how it's such a weird bit of the book yes um and but at the same time, it is a just a very very interesting um, read, and it comes off literally. It it's kind of brilliant, but it's one of those things. If you put in a movie or a TV show, it's just not going to come out right. Mm. Try to put some guy in a bright blue coat and some yellow boots yes. and just dancing around. It's just going to feel very very odd. In the books, maybe not so much. Um, and I think that uh, the showrunners for Game of Thrones probably had the same reaction for George R. R. Martin's stuff because uh, w- the character of oh, Dario Naharis. Uh, one is, of the Daenerys 
people. Daenerys' right? little side boy, yeah. The <laughs> kind of handsome guy with the long hair. In yeah. the books, he is described as having a mustache, and it's like a purple mustache. And, I mean, he's like bizarre. Bizarro man is what you <laughs> might as well call him. Yeah. And the show owners are like, yeah, yeah, no. We're just going to make this guy just <laughs> a handsome Fabio looking guy, and then we'll just, we'll just call it a day. <laughs> That's um, funny. So, <laughs> you know, it's kind of, kind of one of those TV washes, I suppose, or, yeah. or movie washes. And, and Jackson was like, how about we just wash all of this out? And uh, made sense yeah. for the movie, um, but it is a very, very integral part of the book that we'll. I'll, well, you and I will both get into yes. uh, in a little bit. But, well, because uh, yeah. I have thoughts on not necessarily that specifically, but a, a mm-hmm. surrounding topic that is more why Hollywood makes certain decisions mm-hmm. or <clears throat> why certain decisions like that get made for film and TV. And uh, part of that is in on the character of Glorfindel. So we'll talk about that okay. later on in this yeah. episode, but. What's last for our news here? Last is actually a little bit of good news. Well, the last one was good news, too. I think so, anyway. Uh, So, Elden Ring has finally come out with a release date and a name for their DLC expansion, Shadow of the Erd Tree. So, you and I have Mm. been talking, like, I know I've been wanting to get back into Elden Ring uh, to finish it. I've gotten to a certain point in the game where i just and you're you're with total agreement with me on this but if we go back to the game we're just gonna have to re-roll we're gonna have to make new characters <laughs> start from the beginning because the game is so unforgiving that if you try to get to especially the point that i'm at the point that you're at yeah. trying to remember where what goes where and what buttons to hit yeah it's just no, it's not gonna work you out just be it's too not high. gonna yeah it's going to be a, a big no for me, dog, is what the game is going to tell you. So, uh, But, yeah, this yeah. is going to be exciting. So the release date for this, what is the release date for I this? I thought it was what June was? 21st or something around there is what that I recall. Sounds about a lot right. of stuff happening in June. We've got Final Shape. Um, well, ESO's expansion always comes out in June. We've got this. I think mm-hmm. is Dawn Trail June, yeah. maybe? So. I believe so. Yeah, it is June 21st, 2024. PlayStation 4? Oh, really? I guess it did come out. Yeah. Five, Xbox Xbox One, Xbox Series X, and PC. But it's, um, yeah, what is the PC? Oh, I don't know. Because I own it on Xbox, so I'll probably just play it on Xbox. Yeah. um, I definitely want to play it on a controller. Well, you Um, can play on controller on PC. It's $40 across the board if you own... Uh, the previous expansion or f- the main game? Sorry, okay. Eighty dollars if you don't. I think that sounds that's, about right. Sounds about right. Maybe. So it'll be interesting to see. There, I guess there's um, it's a new land, entirely separate, physically separate map, and technically occupies the same space as the lands between. Hmm. Uh, zero. In other words, expect an alternate reality version of the world. Hmm. Interesting. That could be interesting. Um, so I know there's, I think I read there was like 10 new bosses, yeah. um, whole new little storyline. It should be interesting. Um, looking here at some of the pictures. Yeah. It, it's going to be good. And it's going to give me, it's one of those things. It's like, okay, this is, this is why you need to go back and, <laughs> and play it. Yeah. But, you know, wait till this comes out and then go back and play it and then just play it all the way through. Yeah. And finish it and be done. So, yeah. That's kind of how I felt about or still feel about Cyberpunk 2077. Like, I have Phantom Liberty. Mm-hmm. I have the game and Phantom Liberty on PC. In fact, my version, my Xbox version of Cyberpunk 2077, like, the disc just won't work anymore. So, not sure what that's about. So I do need to go back and play it. But yeah, with Elden Ring specifically, our friend who we, you know, we'd have on as a guest on GG Party Chat, Star Dancer, she has been streaming playing Elden Ring through uh, for oh. the completely through for the first time. 
And so I'm watching, you know, I'll watch her streams and I'm like, oh, this, this game was so good, but you almost have to like mentally prepare for it because like, it's not at the same difficulty as most of what you come across day to day. Like it's significantly more challenging. Now it's not mm. the hardest from software game. I think Sekiro often gets that ti uh, title or maybe like one of Dark Souls. Yeah. <clears throat> but I think that's really mostly because Elden Rings gives you the freedom to go do something else if something's mm -hmm. too difficult. And uh, yeah. so that's great. But yeah, I'm, I'm watching her play it and I'm like, man, like, <laughs> I think like when this expansion comes out, you know, whenever I get around to playing the base game and the expansion, I feel like just for the sake of exploring what it is, I'm just going to play the easy route and play a mage because i was pretty dead set on doing nothing but katanas with mm. you know moon veil the bloodhound step um rivers of blood you know like the classic just katana katana only and some of those fights were pretty challenging because of it but <clears throat> Yeah, maybe I'll play a mage. Just use crazy spells because it always looks like fun. And people would always say when that game came out, like, "Oh, playing magic is just easy mode." And uh, well, I don't have time for hard mode, folks. So <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's a big game. It's a big game. Um, with it, it's getting more content. So it's like we still have to get through the base game and now a DLC. So yeah, I mean, but it's, it's exciting to see. Yeah. It kind of sucks for me because I did play as a mage uh, my first playthrough. <laughs> so I'm going to have to go. I think I'm probably going to go into some cleric build that yeah. I've seen that looks a lot of fun because uh, there's some really cool. And I would technically still be a little bit of magic. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, ma the mage was a lot of fun. You do have this like what we would call an ESO, the Jesus beam, the Templar Jesus beam sort of ability that would just melt en enemies. Mm -hmm. If you got the right setup that I finally got near the end there where you could just melt bosses. Um, yeah. You had, it was channeled. So you had to be, you had to time it uh, or you just get one shot. So <laughs> there, there's that. You, yeah. You're going to get one shot a lot, but uh, yeah. It's gonna be it's gonna be fun. It'll be a fun uh, summer trying to bash my head in <laughs> to play that game. But uh, yeah. it it's a fun game, you know, bashing it your head fun. or not. So, and you've yeah. learned some things since then. So maybe it won't be. Yeah, that's that. The point of entry for that game is pretty brutal. Um, yeah. But once you know some things, and once you get around, you you you'll be all right. Right. So. Well, and the first time we played it, we both were kind of like. I'm not really going to look anything up. I'm just going to go explore and see what happens. But now I'll be like, yeah, I don't, I, you know, I've experienced it once. I'm not going to waste my time when I don't have a lot of time. If I want something, I'm going to look up how to get it and then just go from there. You know, and I, I think that's yeah. perfectly reasonable because it's. It's an older know, game now, too. Yeah. So <clears throat> older game. Someone's rolling their eyes because of that comment, but. That's well, true. Old, so they can, <laughs> they can eat it. They can eat it. All right. Well, let's move on to this. All right. All right, class. Settle down. It's time for book reports. Conniff, why don't you kick us off? Really, this should be Conniff and Shiloh because we're going to tag team this one. Um, mm. But I thought long and hard about I don't have a Lord of the Rings themed intro, you know, bumper because we're not really doing this about the video games. Now you have kind of been dabbling a little bit in Lotro. Um, we'll watch our streams when he talks about Lord of the Rings because he's playing Lotro. And so to really kind of approach this multi-episode topic of Lord of the Rings, uh, I wanted to kind of make it this conglomeration of the book plus the Peter Jackson trilogy, plus whatever video games support it, which is largely Lotro right now. Um, mm. Or that Smeagol game that really bombed. <laughs> no, we, we, we we're going to forget that. Yeah, we're forget that. Um, so what I was going to say, too, is, again, like this was in this whole little segment is inspired 
by our friend Ardeth, who is a huge Lord of the Rings fan. You can find him on Twitch, um, I believe, at X Ardeth X. But um, what what he's doing is he's taking his passion for Lord of the Rings and kind of turning it into just a little bit of like, dare I say, book club. But it's a little more, um, more like a book challenge, which is to just read through the Fellowship of the Ring. And I think originally, you know, he had like, we're going to do this many chapters a week. And then he got really busy and life, you know, has been picking up, especially, you know, the closer it gets to warm weather um, where he's at in the U.S. And so inspired by our death, eventually we're going to have him on this show as a guest uh probably on the concluding episode of this whole discussion i don't know if we're gonna do all three books this year maybe we'll do the fellowship <laughs> this year and then you know that'd be good later on do two towers later on do return of the king uh and one i think if you try to do too much you're gonna lose a lot of the detail and i think what's important here is that especially when you're comparing of you know video games with a movie series with a book series you're getting to see a lot of creative license that each of the developers or whatever the producer director of each of these things came up with um, when adapting the book and so we want to get into the details and so why don't you i have i've read up to they're in Rivendell. Um, okay. They haven't got to the Council of Elrond yet, but we're in Rivendell. So I've read up all that, you know, this month, well, February. Um, and so the old forest that you're going to talk about is kind of nestled in the middle of all that. Um, but I want to keep this pretty free form. But why don't you start? We'll start with the old forest and then just kind of go from there as far as conversation goes. So. All right, because <laughs> the old forest is fascinating, you know, not just because of the Tom Bombadil you mentioned, but, you know, just the concept of how hobbits, especially like Frodo, well, not Frodo so much because he was uh, a little more west, I think, is where the Brandy Bucks hang out. Oh, uh, the north Brandy Bucks uh, to the east. So, east, Hobbiton yes, is, that's what I meant. Yeah, so that's Hobbiton, where and the Brandy Brian where, where Frodo, where the Bagginses are. Is to the west of the kind of the yes. western part of the Shire, the Brandy Bucks, <clears throat> kind of the far end, and then the Farmer Maggot um, that Ardith had mentioned on our his yep. little tour of Velotro, and it's mentioned in the books. Uh, it's kind of at the very cusp of the Old Forest, so the Old yes. Forest is basically between what would be called "quote unquote" the Shire, the end of the Shire. Um, your cricket hollow, Crick, Crick hollow, Crick hollow, which is uh, yeah, cricket hollow, Frodo's old or new house, right? Mm -hmm, Technically, mm -hmm. fatty yeah. bulgers hanging out there. Yeah, what a great name! Our death loves yeah. that character, <laughs> <laughs> fatty bulger. And uh, so the old forest is between Bree, where generally it's where the men, you know, the humans live. Not just men, men and women, but uh, so it's uh, it kind of you can either follow the road around the old forest, and Frodo ch chooses in particular to try to lose the track of the Nazgul, and by going through the old forest, uh, much to the chagrin of the other hobbits, but they they all have, especially Mary, who is a brandy buck, and so he has a little bit more knowledge of going through the old forest. They all have a vague knowledge of going through the old forest but uh so in the books and only in the books really unless you play lotro because the movies completely like we mentioned before completely skipped this part of the book yes. um going through the old forest interacting with the barrow white which is its own entity all together uh, but the old forest is said to probably at one point be at some point, it probably was a forest line and kind of connected with Fangorn Forest, which if you're oh, yeah. familiar which... with the movies and, and the books, which is where <laughs> Treebeard is 
where the ints are. There are no ints currently, in, 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 at least in the book uh, series, in the Old Forest. What are in the Old Forest are horns, which is H-U-R-O, like basically horns with a U, okay. um, which are sentient trees. Or like Old Man Willow? Yeah, like Old Man Willow is a horn. Okay. but So they're sentient, um, but they don't walk, talk, any of that kind of stuff. Um, and it's why, you know, the hobbits, when they're going through the old forest, feel it, um, feel like it's, you know, troublesome and they can't really figure out exactly where they're going. They feel like, uh, it's very dreadful, um, uh, like they just impending sense of gloom, yeah. um, like everything is out to get them. And it's more, from what I, when I read it, it felt like the four, the, when you, especially when you play Lotro, you realize that, yeah, there probably is stuff out there to get you, but that's just part of nature. And the old forest <laughs> is just nature, you know. The hobbits are used to gardening is kind of the best way of, of, of trim hedges, of, yes. of planting, of farming, of organized nature. Nature is by nature, excuse the pun there, but it's it's nature by nature. It's it's not welcoming. It's not organized. Yes. It's it's sort of chaos incarnate in a good way. Um well I like the concept it, that it's like the hobbits are used to being masters over the nature that they interact with. And now they're not and the old and forest so they, is the master of itself, right? So Yeah. 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 And in fact, that so so much so that you know they will have vines and stuff that will seem to like almost try to grasp at the hobbits and, and mm -hmm. things and the, while they're traveling. Um, and when they get to Old Man Willow, uh, this is when things kind of take a turn for the worse. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so Old Man Willow was originally, uh, if you read stories about Tom Bombadil, he I don't know. If this is in the books, but Tom Bombadil, Bombadil was originally captured just like the hobbits were by old men Willow and oh, it's not Bombadil. Like this, okay. Bombadil ends think. up basically singing him a song uh, and frees himself out of the situation. So basically yeah. uses old men Willow, and he does this in the books. Like he basically says, you know, let them go. You need to be, uh, digging and you know into the earth and sleeping and eventually Old Man Willow just falls back asleep and lets the hobbits go. He uh, might so mention that, that he, he might m mention that he had actually been caught. Yeah, I don't remember exactly. Yeah. I'd have to go pouring through the pages to find it. You know. So yeah, so Bombadil is not necessarily like the king of the old forest, but he has lived in the old forest for basically since Middle Earth was around yeah. um and he mentions it i think he mentions it in the book that he had been around since the first acorn it dropped so tom bombadil in it, it's basically this non <laughs> definitely non mortal yeah you know, he's seems like he's immortal yes uh and he's not really elf human hobbit dwarf or any of you know orc or He's not a Valar. He's not any. He's not bad, good, or anything. He's just Tom Bombadil. Tom Bombadil. In the book, they also say he's like he's larger than a Hobbit, but he's mm -hmm. around there. You know, same size, I guess. Like I a, think yeah. the character feels a lot like for those who are very familiar with ESO and Elder Scrolls lore. The mm -hmm. character feels similar to Maik the Liar, right? The guy that you can find in ESO just wandering around. Yeah. And a lot of yeah. people assume, or there's a theory that Maik is actually Lorcan, who is like the god, the god of, mm. what is that? I've already forgotten what the Elder Scrolls world's called. But Tamriel? Tamriel. No, the actual planet. I don't remember oh. what it's called. So yeah, whatever. But that's kind of what people think 
there, there are some theories that t- that's what Tom Bombadil is. And so he's, and that's why, mm. like, why do the ring wraiths not follow the hobbits into the old forest? Mm-hmm. Why does, you know, nobody go into the old forest? Why does it have the tales that it has, you know, if it's this evil, dark place or malevolent, I guess would probably be the better term. And Tom Bombadil seems to just wander freely around it and, and makes it his home. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's it's an it's fascinating from that regard. But um, one thing that I wanted to mention too is you mentioned how like the trees, w- the roots would like trip up the hobbits and their ponies as they're walking, you know, into it. But it also mentions in the book multiple times that the hobbits were attempting to follow a specific path mm-hmm. to not go south to the Barrow Downs or whatever direction they're at. But the forest kept popping up trees or not. They don't see the trees just pop up right out of the ground. But like the forest seemed to be pushing them that way with like brambles and thickets and, Mm. you know, dense tree and stuff. So that's fascinating, too, is that it's very much alive, but it's not like. Yeah. Yeah. The the biggest uh, takeaway that I got and I'd still think that this is very true is that the old forest is just very defensive um think of like a a wounded dog uh, this is basically a forest that has been encroached on from both sides the hobbits have been encroaching on that from from uh brandy buck yeah. and they've actually built up a large hedge um around buckland uh, to protect themselves from the outside of the old forest. And when the old forest encroaches and gets near the hedge, they actually go out and chop trees and burn and start a big bonfire and make a big deal of it. The same has been done from their east side, from the men of Bree, and they've been yes. trying to cut down the forest as well. So the forest is <laughs> constantly, and you see this as a very general theme in a lot of Tolkien's work. You see this with the treants with Isengard, in, especially in the movie. You know, a well, wizard should know better, that, that whole thing, with the orcs basically being the destroyers. And this is all from Tolkien's, you know, what he saw with London and, and England in particular, just the industrialization of, of his time. Uh, and he just saw that as a bad, bad thing. So, yeah. Um, this is what you get, uh, you know, if the trees could actually, of our world, could actually be a little bit more sentient, I think you would, <laughs> you would be in a lot of trouble, um, we except in maybe parts of Canada. But uh, yeah, it's, so yeah. it's, you have to kind of uh, go and see that for what it is. And I think that that's I'm probably turning the way my, it's portrayed. My camera Uh-oh. off for a second because my nose just starts bleeding. It's oh, temperature. No. It's temperature here. So I don't know what yeah. the rules are on YouTube about blood. So we're just going to avoid it altogether and turn right. off the camera for a moment while I deal with this. But yeah. classic. This is classic podcast stuff right here. And this is why yeah. we do it live because um, you yeah, know it's you way know. more exciting this way. Now frankly. you know why it's live. Um, I'll turn the bring the camera back in a moment. But I did yeah, want to say to that. It's funny to me, <laughs> um, you know, not ne- this isn't necessarily about the old forest, right? But like just the differences of the book from the movies mm-hmm. in a lot of ways and, and how characters are portrayed. But I do, I think it was that um, Frodo, Sam, Pippin, and Mary hop over the hedge back towards Bree and Aragorn in the book is like here's them here's them talking and so like he was just kind of hanging out around this hedge maybe I'm not maybe it's not the right hedge but I thought it was like the hedge at the edge of the old forest and he's just kind of hanging out there and he hears them talk about yeah that's not the hedge from it wouldn't be the hedge from Brandy Buck it would be the hedge oh, okay. coming from Bree so yeah I, I don't think it would be that particular hedge it's in the game too in lotro like there's a hedge all around i need to go see Brandy that then, yeah the, yeah 
it, the game is such a good fun way to actually read the book you can go around and see a lot of this stuff and I'm sure it's dated but it's it's cool to be able to see some of the stuff from the book you can go through the old forest you can you know you get attacked by spiders and there are horns and uh, yeah. uh, that will attack you there's old man willow um, and there's Tom Bombadil and, and Goldberry yeah. there so you can you can see all that in the game it's kind of fun well, that's. I think that this is in particular, and I don't want to touch on the Barrow Downs. That was almost something I wanted to touch on because in the game, it, you, they they run across a Barrow White, it, just one White, and in the game, yes. you can't just have one White. So there's, <laughs> and, there's and, and there wouldn't be just one White. This is a basically a, a Barrow. There's a huge number of graves and and vengeful when, spirits. Yeah, yeah, and so when the I don't think uh, maybe I guess it was when Sauron I don't think it was Sauron was it Melkor I don't remember somebody came basically through and animated a lot of these dead um, mm. and so that's reanimated them so it's it's it can be terrifying uh, going through yeah. the game and you don't see that on on Ardeth's high level character running around on his horse in the barrel <laughs> when you're a new character yeah. running around and there's whites and there's there's a whole dungeon in there that's really well done and hmm. there's this whole gloom factor so you never know when your character is just not gonna quote unquote roll right and fail his gloom check or whatever and just end up paralyzed and <laughs> hunched over but huh. it's a uh, it's really well done it's it, it's actually pretty scary but it's uh but yeah the old forest in particular it i've always found that a very very interesting part of the book and it's kind of this weird uh uh, it's almost like a trophy for for old tolkien fans they're like well you didn't put this in the movie you know why did tom bombadil in the movie but i could see why they would raise that trophy and be like we you know we need this in the movie but yes i also understand 150% 150% why Jackson didn't want to yeah. he wanted to make a a good <coughs> linear story and this was this is a huge divergent from it but it's a fun interesting divergent and it's sort of like the Radagast thing like mm. why they put Radagast in in the Hobbit movies and it is interesting and fun and Radagast is a kooky if nothing else character mm. but there's a lot of interesting stuff that goes around Radagast that uh, it keeps it from not being just this cartoony character but she kind of was borderline <laughs> in the yeah. Hobbit movies with that so it is what it is, but yeah. So I was going to mention that whole concept of like Hollywood and mm. movies in particular. <clears throat> like a big example of this is the whole Glorfindel thing, right? Mm. So if you watch the 1978 or 79 animated Lord of the Rings, and mm. you watch Peter Jackson's Fellowship of the Ring. Both of those use a different person to get Frodo to Rivendell on the horse and whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, The animated movie uses Legolas and Peter Jackson's movie uses Arwen. And the book, the correct material, uses a character by the name of Glorfindel. And Glorfindel is this sort of elf lord who is infamous for having slayed a Balrog. Uh, he's already at this point, I think they, I don't know where they talk about this. Maybe he mentions it. I don't know. And I haven't been to that, gotten to that part yet, but he, you know, has had run-ins with the Nazgul already too. So he's this larger than life sort of character that is well known by the enemy, by Sauron, by the Nazgul, you know? Um, and so in the book, he goes and he meets up with Aragorn and the hobbits and gets Frodo to Rivendell. And then purposefully does not go with and Gandalf, I think, turns him down or whatever, is not assigned to the fellowship of the ring, right? Mm-hmm. And you know, that was Tolkien's decision. That's what he said. So you look at then the two movies that we've got. 
and they both picked characters that they wanted to use for the rest of the movie. Um, whereas if they would have kept it book accurate and picked Glorfindel, it would have been kind of jarring to like people who aren't familiar with the movies or the books at all. I mean, because here's this cool, crazy, powerful character. He's not going with them to the fellowship. He's literally only here for this one purpose. And that's that. Whereas, mm -hmm. you know, if you go to create a movie and you're like, well, one, like, you know, I'm creating an entire movie about a 500 page book. You know, I've got to make cuts. I know I want to use Arwen later on because it's Hollywood and we need a love interest or some sort of romance that's prevalent on screen. So they just go with Arwen, you know, because Arwen's going to come about in Two Towers. Arwen's, you know, going to come about in Return of the King, obviously. And it also then adds some interplay between Aragorn and Eowyn, which, as I understand it, is not fully in the books. Um, there, I mean, she's obviously smitten by Aragorn, but, like, it's not played up like the movie. And, of course, we're getting to a few a book ahead yeah. <laughs> but like so and you know it's fascinating to me that like glorfindel's a cool character and when you really dive into his history and stuff you know very interesting character with a lot of accolades to his name it it makes a lot of sense why the movies left him out just yeah. he didn't fit <clears throat> Like, there was no other purpose to him other than this yeah. one thing. And that's why you don't see Fatty Bulger. Farmer Maggot's interaction in the movie is very, very quick. Uh, mm -hmm. You don't even see the, the character when he's chasing them through the his fields and stuff. Yeah. So. And, yeah, it's another interaction that uh, Tom Bombadil had a lot of uh, interaction with Farmer Maggot in particular. Mm -hmm which is interesting. But yeah, I think that Glorfindel's omission was probably probably wise. I think it would have felt a lot like a like a Deus Ex Machina mm -hmm. situation where it'd be like, hold on, I will save you and cast this magical spell on this river. Well, who the hell are you? I am <laughs> Glorfindel. And later, and then he just leaves. And, you know, <laughs> it's like, peace. Yeah, just deuces out and he's gone. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, I can see. And I can see why they left out the old forest and the Barrow White and all this stuff. They, You know, you have to trim where you do. And, um, and it serves no you purpose. Sometimes you omit characters because yeah. if you have too many characters, people are like, well, I... It just gets confusing for a general audience, I think. So. Well, right, and it has to set the tone too. Like, like so, if you're if you're Peter Jackson, you're like, I need to adapt this book. The beginning part establishes what the hobbits are like, what their lifestyles yeah, like. You got to do that. So you have to do that, and then getting getting Frodo from the Shire to Bree. Well, there's really only one or two important things that happen that support the following parts of the book. And that's um, specifically when they meet the rider on the road and they hide under the tree and he resists the ring. Mm -hmm. And then getting to the Brandy Wine River. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and so from there, you know, then you look at, okay, like I can cut everything else out because it's all just journey. You know, the f thing at, the Crick Hollow is neat and stuff, but, and maybe at this point he knew that they weren't going to do the whole scourging of the Shire thing that happens at the end of Return of the King. Mm -hmm. And so they're like, well, I don't need to really introduce Fatty Bulger or Farmer Maggot or, you know, anything else about like the Hobbits and, you know, how they have this Fatty Bulger raises the alarm and chases the Ringwraiths out of the Shire. Mm hmm. So then they're like, okay, we just need, once they're in Bree, what do we actually need to introduce? And they need to introduce Aragorn, because he's obviously important to the rest of the story. And then yeah. the, obviously the visual of the knife in the dark and the beds and stuff is really neat. So they're going to include that. And so, yeah, there's just no room for Tom Bombadil because it's like, if, if you boiled down Fellowship of the Ring to the most important pieces for the whole trilogy, it's... What are the hobbits like? 
who are each of the characters of the fellowship, you know, as they get introduced. Mm-hmm. The Morgul Blade and Weathertop is important because it basically, you know, leads to Frodo leaving Middle Earth eventually. Mm-hmm. And so on and so forth. And so all those stuff, like, I think maybe the extended edition has the trolls. I might be wrong about that. Like, the because the, in the book, they come across the three trolls. Yeah. The Bilbo. The, the Bilbo. Yeah. And I think I the extended edition of Fellowship has maybe, them in yeah, a scene. Yeah, I think it does. Because they are, yeah, there's like a stone. Yeah, the stone trolls. But that part's left out, you know, of the theatrical cut. Mm-hmm. All of Tom Bombadil, the Farmer Maggot, the Crick Hollow, um, just a lot of that stuff. Plus, like how much time passes between Bilbo leaving and Gandalf coming back with information on the ring, like mm-hmm. 20, 17 to 20 years <clears throat> or something. So, yeah, I just, I totally get why they do it that way. But it is kind of sad because, you know, it would be really neat to see old man willow tom bombadil goldberry all those characters and just that time spent at Mm -hmm. tom bombadil's house and the stories that he tells them and they're telling him and and also that he seemed to be pretty much 100 percent resistant to the ring like like non-phased unfazed yeah completely unfazed so that's fascinating to me as well yeah i was about to mention that too the uh and that I guess it was a little bit of a of a snippet I think you miss from Frodo's end of things with the ring that Tom Bombadil just it's like oh look a little curiosity and puts on the ring nothing happens yes, to him and in he fact he casts he does something and makes the ring disappear and that's when Frodo is like <gasps> and so that right there you know oh you know you you can kind of you have this little he's more than meets the eye 100 (laughs) percent. yeah like yeah this guy is definitely not a human number one uh number two i i didn't like it when that ring disappeared (laughs) you know that sort of thing and so what what i think frodo immediately puts on the ring just to you know Yep, and he still knows where he's at, I think. Or did I make that? Yeah, and Bombadil can still see him. And there are only a few other people in Middle Earth that can actually sense the invisible, and that would be the Valar Gandalf. Um, I guess Radagast, probably, well, definitely Saruman. uh, And then, of Mm -hmm. course, Sauron. Yeah. uh, And then Gladriel, a couple of the higher elves, probably Glorfindel, too, maybe. And then... uh, yeah, so it's you know he's definitely not, none of those characters, and so he probably <laughs> falls in sort of line with a with a other with world. The Valor. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it's it, it's just interesting to see. So I wanted to pose two questions for this first of these little book reports on this. Mm-hmm. The first uh, I owe to our death because he asked this when he did his you know book stream on this and that first excuse me that first question is what thing or what do you wish was in the movies that is only in the books maybe you would just pick the obvious and say what we've been talking about but is there anything else that like you wish they would have shown in the movies even if just a little bit more or whatever um, but I think this might be it okay. and, and I, you know, it's going to take a, another read of, uh, um, the other two actually you can get farther in this one. This yes. is my actual copy of the book. This is older than you are kind of. That looks sweet. <laughs> it's a, yeah, it's part of like a three little book series. It's nothing too fancy, but yes. the actual, hardcover for the thing this was released i think i probably got it and when it was released in 1982 yeah so for the audio only listeners he's holding up a really old Real school book. looking um, oh, i guess i was gonna say soft cover but <laughs> paperback cover <laughs> yeah it's a just a large paperback um, yeah but yeah it's a 
I don't have Neither mine either. available to me to show on. I need to video, get just a really nice. I mean, they, these are good and they've held up throughout the years. Um, so that's something. But I need to get like just like a really, really fancy. I bought um, a niece of mine a nice hard copy of The mm. Hobbit and it had little animated, or not animated, had little, <laughs> wow. anim, had the illustrations gotcha. um, that are really well done throughout it. And it's a nice, it was a kind of expensive too. It's like a yeah. $40, $50 book just for one book, but it was uh, really, really pretty. I know that Barnes & Noble currently has this gray, like almost leather version of, and it's just all three of the books in one tome uh, with oh, like wow. the old Tolkien or the old Lord of the Rings logo embossed in black on the front and stuff. Mm. I might pick that one up at some point uh, and then cool. retire my the three that I have that are just mass market paperbacks from um, when the movies came out. So, you know, they've got the movie stills on the Oh, case, yeah, so. they got the... Frodo yeah. on one, I think Sam on two towers. Yep. And then Aragorn yeah. on Return of the King. Um, so my answer to that sp specific question that Ardeth posed that I'm posing to you is uh, honestly, Farmer Maggot. I mm. actually, you know, having read the book in my adult life now, rather than just when I was way young, I really like the character of Farmer Maggot. And I think it's because he sort of represents a, a like bridging the gap between hobbit and man he is a mm. hobbit right but like yeah. he lives on the borderlands of mm. the shire and so like he deals with folks all the time he's got three big dogs was like fang is named is one of them i don't remember the other names mm. um and so like he's he's a little more like not well, maybe rough around the edges, but mostly just like, you know, he's, he's like the Shire's guardian almost, you know, just being on this, yeah. the borderland and, yeah. and the time that the hobbits spend there and, you know, they eat dinner with him and his uh, family and stuff. It just very, was a very enjoyable experience, especially considering Peter Jackson's portrayal of him is all, um, mean <laughs> and there's no sort of kindness there but he, in the book he, he yeah. takes them hidden in his uh, wagon to the ferry so mm -hmm. yeah very fascinating to me that that character yep. and then pretends to be Frodo he takes his moniker so Frodo be can become uh, Mr. Underhill I thought that Fatty Bulger did that. Oh, was it Fatty? Yeah, I think so. Because Fatty, Fatty Bulger's the one that's living at Crick Hollow. That's right. That's yeah. right. And flees because the ringwraiths find Crick Hollow, and he runs out the back door and raises mm. the alarm and stuff. But yeah, I loved. Uh, I love the book version of Farmer Maggot. Mm -hmm. He seemed just like a really wise and well experienced Hobbit. That you wouldn't necessarily get where yeah. Bilbo and Frodo lived in the Shire. Def so. Definitely worldly. Like yes. the Hobbits have always, for better or worse, they're very, um, not ignorant, but <laughs> I guess you could call yeah. them very small world. Um, they <laughs> and you, yeah. you see this particularly in the Harfoots as a very you know we stay on the trail and we mm -hmm. mind ourselves and we stay together and we don't. You know, interact with other very, very small town minded uh, Individuals, people yeah. is, is what the what the Hobbit seem. Uh, Farmer Maggot is definitely because he is on the border. He has interaction with men, dwarves, elves, um, even this strange man in a blue coat and yellow boots named Tom <laughs> Bombadil that comes yep. up and talks, talks shop with him and stuff. So he's he's very worldly for a hobbit so um i think that's that was kind of the beauty of, of bilbo's transformation of becoming um a small town little you know baggins to becoming this worldly hobbit that went through all these adventures and yes. you know ran off and did all these things and then could never really leave that behind and end up just you know retiring and saying well, i'm out you know 111th birthday it was mm -hmm. just like peace and 
win in viz and deuced out of that place so yeah there's a lot of talk in there too with bilbo being this odd fellow or this strange peculiar person you know yeah the the number of times they use the word or that tolkien uses the word queer is kind of amusing (laughs) to me (laughs) and it's you know it's just it you couldn't say that nowadays it means totally different things yeah yeah but back then it was just you know things were queer this is which has meant odd, you know. Yeah. But it's it's just funny because it was one thing that I noticed on the on a reread. I'm like, hey, they use that word a lot. Like everything. Mm-hmm. Um, There's queer folk the mentioning... uh, around the. Yeah, they say that. Yeah. Well, they mention it. Um, I have a little note written down. It, it's Frodo being half Brandy Buck, and the Brandy Bucks living on the on the wrong side of the Brandy Wine River, mm. closer to the old forest. Um. So yeah, there's uh and there was a, another mention in the book about um that I've written down about volunteer postmasters for the Hobbit, which yeah. is funny because in Lotro you actually there's a quest line, a very extensive quest line that you can do, where you can volunteer as a postmaster and you just run like a little Hobbit and you have to get to these little other little towns like Bywater and uh, I can't remember all the other little names of of the the towns in the shire but you just volunteer as a postmaster and you have to avoid being spied you know because they have little eyes upon some of the hobbits that are nosy like you have to mm-hmm. avoid the nosy hobbits and kind of go around it's funny it's really really <laughs> funny but uh interesting and then the second yeah. question here was Uh-oh. the inverse and this will be kind of the wrap-up of this first of these okay. book reports what thing or things do you actually think the movie and we'll say peter jackson's trilogy specifically did Mm -hmm. better or you like more than the way that's depicted in the book i have two answers specifically and this is a question i posed to our death on stream um and so i'm not posing it to you but do you have any off the top of your head or you want me to go first i uh... The way Aragorn, I think we maybe I mentioned that on the stream too. You might have been there when, yeah, we were talking about that. The way they portrayed Aragorn, uh, aka Strider, um, is done, I think, perfectly in the movies and Mm -hmm. in the books, a little haughty toddy. Um, Especially on a reread, maybe as a kid. It didn't come across that way. It was just just felt like he was just a real, a tough, mean, you know, don't <laughs> son of a gun. <laughs> yeah, was, yeah, just Aragorn, one mean son of a gun. But he's, he's really know. chatty too in the book, mm, uh, and yeah, I like how stoic and sort of reserved he is in the movie. Well, yeah, it's perfect, um, and fits his character, and he's very begrudging. Lee, he, he he doesn't embrace his his heritage yeah. in the movie, which like some people don't like. But um, I actually I think like it makes more. a lot of sense in yeah. the in the in the movies um, that he wouldn't because it's sort of that Jedi like do I want to tell everyone that I'm a Jedi right now that sort of thing because they're hunting <laughs> do me want to tell down. everyone I am the rightful king of Gondor yeah not. maybe not <laughs> but maybe it's a bad idea maybe I get assassinated tomorrow yeah um, that sort of thing it makes a lot of sense um so I think that would be number one. Oh man well let's see I'm trying to think back well that was one of mine too so we were kind okay. of aligned there well, there we go there's there's one out of the way and my, what's your second one I'm, I'm so thinking. my my second one is everything about the nazgul or the ring wraith so the book and this is where i think the animated movie actually did a better job of telling the books the way the books talk about the ring wraiths because the books, the ringwraiths are very much these sort of shadow shade creatures that kind of hunch and crawl around and they're just sniffing around, right? And the animated movie, that's how they're depicted. You know, they're mm-hmm. black riders, of course, but like 
when they're not on their horse and that, you know, like Mary, and this is in the book and in the animated movie and not in Peter Jackson's movie, but Mary takes a little stroll at night through uh, Bree and actually encounters two of the ring wraiths. Mm-hmm. And that's how he knows to tell Aragorn and Butterbeer or Butterbur and uh, Nob and Bob, I think, are the, <laughs> the, mm-hmm. the prancing pony page or uh, whatever. And um, that's kind of what, ha- you know, they're just si- kind of skulking about, you know, being all shifty and shady and stuff. And so what I like that the movie did, aside from the costume design of the ring race, which is just phenomenal in Peter Jackson's trilogy, I like that they come across as more n- like these dark knights, right? Um, Mm. they're not shadowy sulking around creatures. They feel very like powerful in the movie. Yeah. In control rather than zombie esque. Yes. Um, and they're very terrifying that way, you know? So for instance, think of when there's two particular moments, you know, up to Rivendell Well, after Rivendell, you don't really see the ring race. So whatever. The first is when they all get to the top of Weathertop and their swords are just held in front of them. Like mm-hmm. the imagery of that is very much like these weren't just these shadow creatures that have been reduced to being servants of Sauron, which they no. which they are. But yeah, but they were also once kings. They were also once n- the nine kings. That's kings the way of they men. were buried. Yes, and so that's the way that they carry themselves, and that's the way Peter Jackson's movie. Um, portrays them and the other one is when you know they get to the the river oh I don't remember the river's name but the one out you know Rivendell's river or whatever it is Mm -hmm. where in the movie Arwen crosses and then you know starts chanting the elvish spell or whatever and they all draw when she draws her sword and they all draw their sword at the same time like Mm -hmm. again it's the same thing it's the imagery of them being these you know like fallen dark knights, dark kings, like it's there. And and I think that the movie's version makes the stakes for the hobbits seem that much higher. Like these are, you know, you don't mess with these guys, yeah. <clears throat> but the book, you know, they're just a little more, they're not, they're not as scary for sure, but maybe a little more like Gollum creepy type, like, you know yeah skittering around yeah. or whatever so yeah i could definitely see that it's a lot more m- mature stance i guess that jackson took on a lot of that kind of stuff um i don't think yes. tolkien necessarily meant it to be hobbit-esque um yeah yeah I child know. stories but i don't think he really had that there, there just wasn't that type of material for him to pull from right uh, back and then. And so the imagination, I think, was able, maybe Jackson was able to kind of pick that out, of it, especially from his horror background. Yes, he and I was going to say, Ardeth mentioned that when I when I said the same thing on the stream, is that it was, Tolkien okay. comes from a horror background. So, yeah. And that I fit think that, perfectly, I think. Yeah. Are we talking about just the Fellowship or all three books from the movies? specifically the fe- i mean all of them but i i don't okay. remember like how the ring wraiths are portrayed later on in the books just because i haven't read them in 20 years yeah. so well, i'm just thinking of the uh the undead that aragorn um i can't remember the oh. name um yeah the, i don't remember the, the kings um that whole the way that that was done in the movies is just Spot, spot on. on yeah yeah i love that that green ghostly it's really really good uh it's not overly done it's just kind of you know whoa, well i remember yeah like when they're going into the mountain to go talk to these people and the horses are just like scared nope. out of their minds <laughs> yeah. yeah so yes um and we'll, maybe we'll talk about that again when whenever we get to return of the king but I agree with that a hundred percent. So, um, I think that's all we've got for this first book report, unless you've got something else. But again, we're going to do a few episodes of this, um, just because 
why not? You know, yeah, Lord of the I mean, Rings. We're kind of we're kind of waiting for something b- big to happen <laughs> in the video. Yeah, game well, space. I mean, I mean, stuff's kind of. I mean, who knows? I mean, Dragon's Dogma Two comes out later this month. That's kind yeah. of exciting. I, I'm sort of looking forward to that. I don't know. Play the first one a little bit, but not nearly enough to really. I don't know much about the world. I know yeah. it's a Capcom game and it looks really cool and there's supposed to be multiplayer and it's sort of got a new <laughs> souls like uh, light um, oh, thing yeah. where you can play multiple. I don't know. It looks good. It does look good. Um, so we'll see. Yeah. But um, yeah, like you said, we're kind of just waiting and uh, you know, when our death posed that challenge of reading it again, I was like, you know what? I was just like just had started getting sick. I was like, mm-hmm. I don't feel like playing any video games, but I do feel like going, getting my Fellowship of the Ring, and starting this book. And mm-hmm. here we are, and watching so. it. Yeah, I've actually watched a number of different. In fact, I, <laughs> you want to talk about the way Ring Racer depicted? Here's a funny one. So rewatch, or I don't know. Actually, I'm pretty sure you never even saw it. The uh, I mentioned it before. The Return of the King was an animated oh, uh, yeah. series that was. I think it's done by the uh, uh, crap. Uh, I almost said Calvin and Hobbes, but the. <laughs> it's a it's the, the same By people the, that did the hobbit yes um they and those two one. are different than the ones that did the lord of the rings that movie, did right? the okay. lord of the rings one that i recommended that was what i grew up on with the self-shaded orcs and that that you had just mentioned with the animated not you know yeah um way that they're depicted um but yeah the, <laughs> this one is a joke it's a it has some funny songs in it and oh. uh yeah, there's. Uh, I remember as a kid singing. Uh, they have this folky guy at the very beginning that has this vibrato in his voice. So it's. <laughs> I'm gonna. I'm gonna attempt it, Rod. Here we go. <laughs> Here we go. You have a bloody nose, and I'm gonna attempt to attempt sing. Attempt to so, sing. <laughs> um, so he's like, Frodo of the nine fingers. He does that. And he, In the ring of doom. That's the way the oh, whole song goes. Oh, that's so old and late, school, too. Later on, there's a... Um, <laughs> they have the orcs, and they're they're being whipped to go to battle, I think, maybe to go to Helm's Deep or something. And they have this little song. It's like, where there's a whip, whoosh, there's a way, a way. When there's a whip, whoosh, <laughs> there's the? a way. We I do don't want to go to war today. And they're just, they're, they're ridiculous. And the witch king of Agmar yeah. is depicted like Skeletor. Like, <laughs> he's basically got this red All crown right. and no face. And his voice is pretty much spot on like Skeletor. You could have basically, if you were to take the key I'm coming for you. Or what yeah. was the voice? Something like that. And, you know, the, the little uh, yeah. animated version of Eowyn, they have like talking and stuff. And then <laughs> the Skeletor man <laughs> on a stupid little, it looked like a whelp dragon that was flying around. I'm just like, oh God. <laughs> I think even as a six or what I, I would have been about six or seven at that time in my life, I probably even at that age was like, this is, this is kind of silly. Get this garbage out of my face. <laughs> I don't want to watch this. Um, That's but, funny. Yeah, that, would, that cracked me up. Well, I think it's time for. Oh. Pick a card, any card. The deck of many things. Well, thank you. I think I will pick a card. All right. So we're going to shuffle right here. Yeah. I don't know if I can get them close to the mic and shuffle. I'm not a card. A card shuffler. That's what... Guru. That's good enough. It picked up on the mic, but that's what uh, what I did for that little little bumper. I just did the little rifle shuffling and... um, I, don't I know can what they do call that. It. These cards are fairly new too, so they're fairly thick. So it's like shuffling cardboard. They're also tarot right. size, so they're a little awkward. Yeah, they're little, and my hands are small, like a hobbit. All <laughs> right, so here we go. We're gonna pick one. We're gonna cut it like so. We'll drop, draw the top card. Ooh, 
Can you see that? The, the knight. knight. Speaking of knight type mm. figures. All right, so I got to pull this up from the old. The old dock. What the old is dock. what does this card of the deck of many things do, Shiloh? Mm. Is are we about to have another hour oh, of episode? Here we go. <laughs> What album can you listen to again and again without getting sick of it? Okay. I ha actually have an answer off the top of my dome. Mm. So. Yeah, you go first. I'll go. Yeah, well, I, I wouldn't be surprised if you had one, too, off the top of your head. But mine, so there was this old 80s and 90s Christian rock band. And now what you need to understand is that's a very, like, almost oxymoron right especially mm -hmm. for that era um but all that really meant is that it was 80s you know hair band style music so you've i'm assuming you've heard of striper and this it's it's not yeah. striper that i'm talking about no but um you know that was a big thing back then you know how can we turn jesus into hair metal <laughs> and so that was striper effectively but no yeah um with uh with b costumes yes this band was called white heart and yep. their album highlands Wait, i'm thinking of white lion never mind Go no. on. so white heart um and their album highlands is very very well like for the longest time you know and i listen to music across all spectrums you know doesn't matter the genre like one minute i could be listening to kendrick lamar and then the next minute i'm listening to taylor swift and the next minute i'm listening to this whiteheart album right mm -hmm. um but the way that all the songs are produced was this very like big band you know just epic quality to it to where i think it's probably my favorite album of all time i haven't listened to it ironically you know interestingly enough in years at this point but mm -hmm. uh it's it's just very very well done like the vocal harmonies are spot on the melodies are great the guitar solos are fantastic for the few songs that have them uh, there are some sick bass lines like just the whole thing is like every instrument feels like it has a place and purpose throughout the the whole album so hmm. and as a musician that's like you know that's really what kind of keys me in on this this one specifically is like it, it's it feels like you're watch you're listening to like a really good seven course meal right like everything mm. complements from the beginning appetizer to the dessert there's some theme or whatever everything plays its part in that <clears throat> that's me trying to uh bring nice. it to your level i guess <laughs> <laughs> oh man let's see I listen to I mean there are, I could think of several off the top of my head I think um what would be known as what I know as the quote unquote parentheses album by Sigaros I uh, I figured you would say Sigaros just because number 1 you don't ever understand exactly what they're saying <laughs> so you can't really get you can't get sick of the vocals cuz yeah. it feels like they're singing in Elvis anyway um, mm -hmm. so it's all melody and it's just a, it's beautiful it's a little bit chaos especially near the very end that last track on the album is yeah. incredible it's just a big frantic mess um but that album is really really good uh actually two of their albums maybe, maybe no you know what i'm gonna take that one out i'm just gonna replace it with tack their album tack mm. it's a little bit more melodic i think it can really yeah I'll I'll just say Sigaros Tack. Okay. Um, yeah, I could think of a bunch, but <laughs> I'm trying to think of like an alt country album because it just yeah. probably uh, Cold Roses by Ryan Adams and the Cardinals. That album is I really love that album. Hmm. Um, but yeah, so we'll just we'll just say those two albums. There's probably some sort of older. Uh, 
Yeah, uh, I mean, we'll, it's hard, we'll too, because, it like, a lot of people that, you know, really love, like, classic rock would say maybe, like, Led Zeppelin Four or something. Isn't that the one with Stairway on it? Yeah, it's Black Dog and Stairway to Heaven. Or, um, you know, maybe newer would be, like, Appetite for Destruction by Guns N' Roses. Like, a very solid album with songs. But Ooh. for me, specifically, it's the fact that for In Highlands, like, each... Like the whole thing seems very cohesive from the beginning to the end. It's not like a concept mm -hmm. album where they they actually do that. Yeah, it's like just, a yes album or something. Yeah, yeah, no, I get that. That's and I think that both of these albums that I mentioned are very similar to that yeah. too. Like they're very cohesive. They they they're not same o same o each song, which some artists tend to do. But it's you know, there's enough difference in each track. Where it just feels, everything feels like it does in a book. That's the way it feels. Yeah. So. Um, I do, the, the reason I, it's funny that I had an answer to this immediately. Because at one point in college, I did a blog post somewhere on my top five favorite albums of all time. Of course, mm -hmm. Highlands was number one. But the only other one that I can remember off the top of my head was... Have you ever heard of the band The Classic Crime? They're kind of like an indie... I don't know what they are now, but when the album... Um, was it Phoenix? The name of the album? I don't know. There, it, there's, ocean, there's an ocean on the cover and a little square or something. <clears throat> hmm. um, that was on there too, and that was a very good, very cohesive from beginning to end album where all the... Like, I would... you like. It's when you don't skip any of the songs that you know, like, yep, I like this whole, this whole thing. So, mm -hmm. yeah. But yeah, that's a good off the wall like deck of many things question. I like that. Yeah, yeah, that's gone from the board now. I've erased it. <laughs> I, I still got to replace the last one that we did. So, but it's, yeah. it's fun. All right. Well, that I think does it for this episode of yeah. questing the multiverse. We will. Wait, we should figure out how to say questing the multiverse in Elvish. In Sylvan. If that's yeah, in Cinderin or whatever. If that's even possible, yeah. I don't know. I don't know. Probably not. Maybe it is. I only, I only know a few few words. Most of them come from listening to NPC say them in Lotro. So. <laughs> like Megavon. Nice. Melon. Yeah, Melon. I know that one Melon. from that's the just, movie. Oh yeah, you've got the Minds of Moriador on your. I'm not hailing Hitler. I'm just showing <laughs> yeah, my we, tattoo. Let's be, let's be okay. clear here. Uh, well, <laughs> I'll hit the button to cue us out. Thank you, listener, for giving us an hour and some change of your day. We appreciate you. We hope you had a good one. Whether you were driving, just sitting back in your car, sitting in your bed, yeah. whatever. And we mm -hmm. still need a good sign-off catchphrase, but today is not that day. <laughs> today is not the day. Oh, man. All right. Well, talk to you in the next one. Peace. Yep. Later. Questing the Multiverse is brought to you in part by Conic Productions, Hal's Wood Designs, and Joel Crawford. To follow along with our adventures, please follow us on Twitter at QTM Podcast and consider joining our Discord, a link of which can be found in the show notes or in our Twitter bio. Want your questions or comments read on the show? Email us at questingthemultiverse at gmail.com. Finally, if you enjoyed this episode, please consider giving us a review or a follow wherever you listen to podcasts. Thank you for listening.